Okay, so I think we are a couple minutes over and can get started. Um, can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Yeah, okay, awesome. So um, thanks everyone for uh, joining the call. Uh, this is one of the first um, SIG API calls. And for today, um, there are a couple of agenda items. So the, the community has been um, having this proposal for um, <clears throat> having an established process for um, SIG API, well, API review in general, so that um, the APIs, tubeboard APIs, um, evolve in a graceful backward compatible way. Um, so today, wanted to walk through that proposal. Um, you know, kind of distill out the next steps in order to get it merged and get this um, effort started. Uh, and then following that, um, there is another agenda item that Lee put in here um, where once the agreement has reached to move this SIG forward, um, you know, some of the semantics of um, what would it be like to bootstrap the, the SIG? So that's the second agenda item. <clears throat> so I'm going to go ahead and get started with the first um, uh, proposal. So for the proposal, I wanted to take the time to go through this PR, um, hopefully um, answer any outstanding questions that folks might have. and. At the end of this PR, there is a, a tool. Uh, this tool will help uh, automate a lot of, uh, you know, process for reviewers. So um, I'm going to uh, demo that tool and, and then uh, open it up for questions. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> Digging into this particular Emma, right? Um, sorry, I'm just increasing the font size a little bit. Um, there are four distinct goals that I have identified in order to uh, you know, improve this process. One for the contributors. So all the contributors that are new and want to implement an API facing change, they should have some guidance. Um, Second, for the um, reviewers, um, there there is an upstream Kubernetes had a, has a very well refined process where there is a list that reviewers can go through and check those items and make sure that the quality of uh, pull requests and changes coming in adhere to a certain guideline. So um, the second goal is to have a similar checklist for um, downstream, sorry, uh, similar checklist for reviewers. Um, the third item is a little bit um, where we need um, more discussion is that since we are starting this process now, there could be easily um, uh, places where our API has broken and we will find that out um, as this effort grows. So once we find out a breaking change, how is the community going to handle that? So we should have a guideline for that as well. Um, and then the fourth one is all of these um, uh, proposals would um, could have certain um, tools um, that could make contributors and reviewers life um, easier. So, um, there is uh, this um, PR proposes uh, one such tool to make um, reviews um, easier. Um, I want to take a pause here. Does anyone have um, suggestions or a feedback on the goals for, for this SIG? No, it looks good. 
thank thank you for putting that together. It's it's clear. Clarity's good. Awesome. Yeah. Um just wanted to say that uh change so when so when things break during an upgrade, there are um mostly two or more uh, patterns that I have seen. One is that the API itself um, has a breaking change. So an example is that uh, a field which was a string is converted to an int um, and that is a API breaking change. So that is one bucket of um, breakages. The second bucket is where the API remains the same, but the controller behavior changes. So for example, a field which is a string defaults to um, a certain value by a controller and after after the upgrade, it um, behaves differently. So in this particular um, proposal, uh, going after those behavioral changes is, um, is a non-goal. Uh, that involves uh, a lot of mm. lot of extra um, care and it could be a follow up from this so wanted to keep this proposal focused on specific um, api related things okay so with that i want to talk about uh, user stories so there are multiple ways um, in which KubeWord, you, like users can you use um, KubeWord, right? Um, one is that uh, a simple user where they create a bunch of YAML and um, they want to create a VM from that and uh, you know have their workloads run as a VM. So for those users, um, the API should be intuitive. Um, it should be stable and should not break um, over upgrades. Um, over the years, Kubeword has done a great uh, job in, in helping these users. Um, the, the second kind of user is a contributor, right? So uh, as a contributor in the community, I would like to have some guidance on what's the right way to approach an API facing change. So this is heavily um, inspired from Kubernetes. Um, I'll talk about that in detail later on. And then the, the third and the fourth is about the reviewer. So as a reviewer, I need a con comprehensive list of checks that I can um, you know, take care of um, during approving an API facing change. And if possible, all of these checks, which can be automated, should be automated in terms of CI CD. So like CI, pipelines so that um, it can make the reviewing of um, PRs um, easier. So those are the user stories I have. Um, are there any, any things here that anyone would like to, you know, get changed or um, added to this? Yeah, when you say checks, you mean um, like built-in unit tests, ins and outs, or something different? Yes, so that's a great question. So by checks, I mean, I have not come up with a comprehensive list of checks yet, but all of the things which can help uh, improve uh, automated tooling, right? So for example, unit tests, end-to-end uh, -end tests, so, um, I know there is a room for improving uh, upgrade test. So for example, if you are um, implementing an API facing change and there is a doubt that upon upgrade, uh, this will break, um, a reviewer can easily ask for an upgrade test for that feature, right? So tests, um, behavior or semantics of that change and um, making sure that uh, it's not backward uh, incompatible. Those yeah. are the three things I have in mind. So if I'm hearing you right, and I agree, is 
you, you're going to go through an API by API, and each, each API will have some sort of a feature test that is associated with it, ideally? So I, I am not sure about that, right? Uh, okay, agreed. <laughs> there, there, yeah, there are ways. So um, let me go through this. Um, when I talk about this. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. let me API let you do your project. thing. It's fine. Yeah. So yeah, um, what I was trying to say is that there are tools that can be built where you don't have to go through um, API by API. And for example, this tool, it automatically generates a bunch of um, YAML for all the APIs and then serializes it and deserializes it. So you can find out whether upon upgrade, your new Golang structures will be able to um, deserialize the older JSON, which is in the API, right? So that kind of tooling will make uh, reviewing easier. Um, if we, I mean, certainly adding each feature and adding a test for each feature retroactively could be one way out, but I'm not sure if um, the community has bandwidth to, you know. Um, a hundred percent agree. I, I'm, yeah. I, that's, that's a good answer. Let, let's Let's do the important things. That's fine. Yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we can. So one of the um, outcomes of this call is to come up with a list that we can get started with and see um, how it fares. And easily we can add on things to that list um, as well. Okay. I, I just wanted to have a remark here. Uh, sure. I'm going over this document and I'm commenting on it now, but it's not especially what you just said. I think it's way more complicated because there are API changes that are fine to break. And for example, any alpha feature that is feature gated can be breaked. So we can remove it. Uh, there are like, there are actually other meet the other discussion done now about feature lifecycle that tries to define it in a more in a better way. But if, for example, you have a feature that has a, that it uses a field and it is it was uh, de uh, declared as as currently as alpha with a feature gate uh, set, then it's pretty fine to change it while it is in alpha. So I'm not sure how so, it will work with this one. So I agree, um, but I have a question for you. So let's say you have a feature um, which introduces a field, right? Um, but, and that feature is alpha, but the field which is being introduced is in a virtual machine instance API. The virtual machine instance API is V1. So as far as the API is concerned, uh, users expect the stability for V1 API. So are you suggesting that since this is an alpha feature, we can go ahead and remove that field for from a V1 API? Yes, I think the, the V1 API has nothing to do with the, it's not related to the to the specific feature. We have examples of that in even in Kubernetes. Some some experimental features are are tried out. They are not introduced in 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 a new version of the the manifest in if if the CRD for in this case or or the manifest in general. They are just added. For example, you have a, a field added. You have a feature gate by that is by default disabled. So if someone decides to enable it by themselves and start using it, they need to be aware. And this is what they do. They are supposed to know that if they use it, it may change what it is in this stage. It's like a definition that needs to be done and they are they are taking like, it's like, you know, it's like the yeah. alpha and beta version that they may not 
in the G, in the in the GI when when the feature will uh, reach GI, it may be like that or it may not be like that because it's still ex experimental. So this is happening today, I think, and and uh, at least from the discussion on the on that on that uh, feature uh, lifecycle. Uh, the agreement is that while anything that is feature gate at the moment is in this stage, like if it's feature gated and by default disable, you cannot trust it that it will remain like that. Yeah, I so I agree with you partially that Kubernetes has a way of uh, doing this, but um, all of these features that I have ran into, they are either. Uh, alpha or a beta API. Um, I have not run into a scenario, for example, where a feature was introduced in a pod API, which is V1, and then it was removed or deprecated. Um, because if, if you have pod running in a cluster and if you upgrade a uh, Kubernetes and a field was deprecated, then the upgrade could likely break, right? So I, oh, it I could think- break on if you used it. Yes, yes. Um, it could break if you used it, but for all the users that have used it, it the upgrade would break, right? Yeah, but it's, it's like if the, the user, so first of all, I think I, I will try to, if you want, I, I can try. I think there were examples of this use in Kubernetes, but I can I can also tell you that even if it's, even if, I think there is, but I'm pretty sure this is what will reach, will, this is what will happen here because there is no other way for us to, to test uh, things. Um, it's like if you if we add something that we want to introduce, we can. It's like we don't know what is correct or incorrect. For sure, we can. We are just guessing. So we are trying to put something that we thought about on the API, and if we find out that it is a mistake or there is uh, it doesn't answer something, then we have the potential to either just drop the feature completely or modify it as expected. And I think it, it makes sense. If a user decides to use an alpha version, it's he needs to understand that this is the risk that he's taking, that the, the definition of the, the feature uh, stage is that it is not stable. And I think I think they, they and what I read, I can send you maybe later uh, reference on Kubernetes, they, ha they are defining that as well, even per, per field. Uh, what, what happens about the versioning of the API in the, if you're talking about the version in the manifest, if, if uh, something went out as GA, if, if a feature, for example, is called GA now, you no, no longer are able to remove it ever until you update the, the major version. So only then it's, it takes effect. So, so there are like uh, different stages of this. What can okay. be changed? Otherwise, it will not be possible to have progress here. Yeah. Edward, um, Edward, thank you. I appreciate the the comment. I think that's healthy. Um, I, I like the idea of getting examples. Um, if we can get some examples, and the other thing that I can suggest, and to pile onto you, what you're saying is, um, and what's worked for me in the past is to make success criteria, define success criteria. It works, it doesn't work, you know, pass, fail into the release uh, of the given feature. So that's my two cents. I'll be quiet now. Thank you. I think we can make uh, some automation, like if if we have some way to mark it or maybe have a file that tracks al what is alpha, what is not, what is beta, what is GA, maybe then yeah. something can be done. Yeah, it's not impossible. Yeah, it makes sense to me. And Alay, you were worried that we were gonna be quiet. Yeah, um, I was just uh, noting down the, um, the gist of the um, discussion here. So 
from what I understand, we talked about um, whether we can introduce alpha fields in a V1 API. And um, I, I think we'll look for uh, look to Kubernetes for guidance on how it does this. And uh, once we have examples, this can be um, added as a refinement in, in the proposal. Um, however, um, I'll look forward to Edward's comment um, and, and we can handle it. But thanks for bringing this up, um, Edward. Um, I, I think we can, um, you know, refine the way how we are approaching um, new features um, in in this proposal as well. Okay. Um, so from there, um, going forward uh, to the actual proposal. Um, so in order to you know, achieve all of this, I, I think it is very important to have like a um, call on a regular cadence. Um, and in, uh, so I'll dive into the, um, I'll dive directly into the API review uh, process, right? So there is a, a label which says kind uh, API. So for all the pull requests, um, I have it here. So for all the pull requests that have um, API uh, facing changes, they can be easily identified by uh, this label. And this proposal is um, uh, uh, kind of proposing to have a call on a regular uh, cadence so that uh, reviewers can, you know, have discussions around whether an API facing change could be, um, you know, taken forward. Are there alternative ways to do it and things like that? Um, in the past, in the past, there are um, two or three examples where um, a couple of other um, engineers in the community and I had a discussion around what's the best way of um, taking this API forward. And we found those um, discussions to be very healthy and um, it led to a, an API facing change that was uh, much better than um, what we had um, initially thought of. So because of this experience, um, a call like this where we can talk about um, API facing changes and kind of um, cement out the best practices um, in in a guideline document, um, that would be the best way of um, going forward. And that's what is uh, proposed um, in this uh, document. So, um, you know, to summarize, once we have a regular call, um, either as a preparation or, um, you know, in the call, you can take uh, some PRs from here and move that forward. And in that call, um, even first time contributors or anyone needing um, reviews on um, and like a design or um, new features for um, API facing changes, they can also um, attend and um, you know, get initial guidance on um, whether that API would be um, okay or not. So, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm in favor of having this cross-sig uh, ownership. Uh, just note that at the moment, I don't think Kubert has any such, uh, at least there is no, nothing formal that someone owns uh, a cross-sig uh, ownership. For example, there is no no ownership. There is no one or, or a group responsibility on the API, as you suggested here. But there is also no, nothing else that I know. Like, there is no end-to-end -end test ownership uh, uh, as one. It's like each maintainer of each SIG 
is owning it by themselves and sometimes they are uh, interacting or getting advice but this is not formal so so just need to i think this needs to also be raised with the with the i guess with the with the maintainers so they will agree to this because this this adds uh something that i guess does did not exist before uh, that's right open up other things so um that's a great point and so there are in order to get things formal right um i i think what you're suggesting is that for all the uh pull requests that have this label um if there is a way for folks in this call to own those changes and you know kind of gatekeep the, um kind of gatekeep them um to move it forward um then we will definitely need a, a formal structure for that right but i'm wondering if you know before we go ahead and make that formal suggestion do we just want to try out um by voluntarily picking up the prs and uh making them in a you know better state and then once we have a list of you know 10 prs or 20 prs where we have successfully um uh, you know helped out the the changes we can go ahead and make it formal i was i was not sure on what the right way to address that is um do you guys have thoughts well i don't have a something i i guess the only thing that um it's like maybe what i'm not really sure what can be done but uh, i guess you could try with taking as you said uh, uh, some some of the changes that are ex in existing prs or maybe even prs that got merged and maybe try this uh, this this um review or uh, in this in this c context you can try it like uh, in a non uh, enforcing manner to, for example just to give feedback about it and see if it passed didn't pass from your perspective maybe see how much time it takes to handle it uh and then mm -hmm. you can come with that as a as an example of what was done yeah. what can be done but the, but what my, my point is also that you need to understand that there is like a um it's like you want uh, this is explicitly changing the the way and the ability for for people to approve things like uh for example if you want the if you want to enforce this somehow then what it it means uh, just an example is that you will have someone that is owning or is the maintainer of the of the api okay mm -hmm. the files that define the api and then this is what happens actually in, in kubernetes per what i know so if someone changes the file in the api it will automatically require uh, an api approver and even mm -hmm. if the maintainer of the specific sig approves the change it will still need to go to the api approver for his approval mm -hmm. like, if it's not the same person i mean so yeah uh, So this is this is what I mean by uh, and this is changing the way things are working now because it's like if you want to look at it in in other way it will probably slow down development and it may or may not uh, be likeful to to the existing maintainer so you, I think you need support in this also from behind the scene like maybe you need to talk with uh, some some maintainers that can support you in this with this idea and they will work with you yeah. and, and suggest you what to do I and mean, you need support on this yes that's an excellent point and uh, part of the reason why i wanted to uh, jump on a call is i was hoping that uh, some of the the maintainers would come and attend uh, so that we can have the discussion going so um 
I will take it as an action item to, um, you know, invite uh, more folks and have this discussion with them so that um, we can get their guidance on how to uh, formally, um, you know, achieve this. But, um, you know, the other suggestions that you were having, right, on trying out, trying this out on some existing PRs and seeing how this goes. So regarding that, uh, we've been um, trying to do this. Um, so if you see the proposal is open since like two or three months, and in that time, there were some PRs that uh, come along my way where I was able to, you know, talk with, talk regarding the API facing changes and, um, you know, make them uh, better. For example, this is a multi-architecture support for KubeWord. Um, we had a lengthy discussion here, Ryan, I and um, Ramon on how to make this better. And the same philosophy that we used here was um, used in this PR. Uh, it was exactly similar. And the reason why I bring it up here is that we've already been trying to do something like this. Um, but since this call is now on a weekly cadence, I think um, in next, um, in the upcoming calls, we will have some more examples of um, these kinds of um, review from from. Um, this call and we can discuss it here. Does that kind of um, fall in line with what um, you were suggesting, Edward? Yeah, I think so. It's, uh, I, I, so. I don't have a full solution here, it's just suggestions. So you'll have to, yeah, yeah. You know, to go between the, the thick trees here. Yes. Yes. Yeah, my um, I think what I hear is that if if we have a, a regular um, you know reviewal reviews um, process for like next um, upcoming call, then we can take that. So for example, in this two PR, um, we found one best practice that we could use, right? Because those were exactly similar. So if we can come up with common set of items in, in next few calls and, you know, continue to iterate on that list, it would be a very, um, a very good first step to come up with a checkpoint list. Um, and, and then we can take it from there. But yes, I 100% agree. Um, you have to have um, something uh, and it will come at a cost. Um, that cost is um, probably slowing down the feature development. And uh, so, yeah, we'll, there should be a discussion with uh, maintainers on this. Okay. <clears throat> so, okay. Um, once to this here is exactly what I was proposing in the sense, um, we will we'll have a regular call and review um, API facing changes. There is one item in here. Uh, which might need a little bit more discussion. Um, it is what happens if we or if somebody else finds an API breaking change and um, it's already been shipped and it's already um, in use, but it was found for the first time. How, like, what are the guidelines for the community to handle such changes? 
Um, this is hard because if things are already um, used in production, then maybe the fix will also um, introduce some unnecessary uh, burden for for the community. So it's really uh, not, um, it really is a situation where users are um, in a bad spot because they've found a break, but uh, a breakage, but a but the community might not be in a place to handle that breaking change. So we'll probably have to find a way to, to solve this and make it uh, better. So my initial thoughts are that if any such break breakage is um, identified, um, let's say it's identified in the last release, um, then the current release will introduce the fix um, and the fix will be maintained for around three releases and then the fix can be uh, dropped. The idea is that maintaining the fix for three releases will help users get onto a version with the fix. So the upgrade will happen from last version to the version with the fix and then uh, from there on, they can upgrade to the next version um, without the fix, um, and um, they have an upgrade path. Um, right now, the problem is that if there is a break, there is no uh, upgrade path. Users are on their own. Uh, I want to take a pause here. Um, it, do you guys have um, thoughts on this or uh, suggestions? Uh, the only the only comment here is is that it, I think this one is related strongly with the features lifecycle. So mm -hmm. what you what you what is what can be broken, what is not, then that's like. But this is the only comment I have. I just just know that this, I think some of the things are here are uh, are, uh, are if we'll, yeah. we will get some information from like the rules of of how to to see what is correct and what not. We'll probably discuss in that uh, in that discussion. I think that because you you started working on this one, maybe it's. It would be good that we will uh, make that discussion more visible because currently it's, uh, it's just an idea that was raised and it, I, I'm not sure if it was made public. So I think it should okay. be made public. Okay. So um, yeah, what I hear is that this section needs a little bit of uh, refinement and alignment with the feature lifecycle. Um, the refinement is that if, for example, the breakages is in alpha or beta um, APIs, then it's okay to have those breakages. Um, I think implicitly I meant that the breaking feature is a V1 API, but I will make that um, explicit here. So kind of what I was meaning was that if a breakage was found um, in a V1 API that was unintended um, and just slept through because um, you know we got unlucky. Um, how would we deal with that? Um, so yeah, I I will make some refinements and I'll look out for that feature lifecycle uh, proposal that talks more in depth about this. Okay, so I think that's all I had for this particular document. Uh, I would like to take a few minutes to also talk about the tool. Um, this tool is what I was proposing as um, having in having uh, in the CI/CD pipeline. So um, you can imagine that if an API uh, facing change is uh, made in terms of a pull request, there will be a set of unit tests which 
which will which are proposed here in this tool, which will be run um, against that PR and against those changes, and it will identify whether the API is um, backward compatible or not. So with that context, I want to go through what um, this tool does. So um, there are two distinct things regarding APIs, right? One is the Golang structures. So if you take a look at virtual machine instance, um, in the code, we have virtual machine instance, instance Golang structs, and then we have the JSON representation. So the thing that will break is, let's say if the JSON submitted by the user is for the last version, and if it has a field which was removed, um, when, when the user upgrades to the current version, uh, since that field is not present, uh, user will not be able to create that same JSON. So this is an example where converting or serializing that JSON or YAML into the Golang struct and then deserializing it. So uh, from the Golang struct, uh, converting it back to the uh, JSON or YAML um, file um, checks. Check. So if we do this process, it checks out whether um, this change is backward compatible or not, right? So the proposal here is that anytime we ship a release, um, there will be a automatically generated test data. So you can see in this folder, I have shipped three releases, 0 0.59, 0 0.50, and 0 0.48. Um, um, so it, it's in the reverse, it's in the order of um, which I went through. And then this is the uh, current, uh, release. So within each release, there will be a um, there will be a JSON and YAML file of all the APIs. So I'm going to open up the YAML for virtual machine instance, right? So you can see these are automatically generated um, values using um, reflection package in Golang. Um, Right now, these values are not fuzzed um, because I just wanted to do a small POC, but Kubernetes has a way where the values are actually fuzzed. So they will be generated randomly. And once you have this, right? So the proposal is that um, you, can, you can run a sample test that will check whether the current Golang structures can structures can read from a previous release and whether um, the previous um, release is backward compatible or not. So once I run this test, I found out that there are um, two fields uh, which got changed. One is the um, floppy. Um, field in virtual machine instance, and one is the runtime user field. So upon more digging, um, I found that this particular field was uh, dropped. Um, it was specifically dropped um, with an intention that there will be, uh, uh, there is no need for that field, and we would be uh, okay with the ramifications of dropping with field. So this particular API breaking change was um, covered, but what I found was that this API change was not um, actually, the second one was not intended. So if I look at, sorry. So if I open up this PR, um, there was an API change, but the, okay. So this is an optional field and I found out that omit empty tag was missing in this particular field. And that's why uh, this 
even though this field is run as uh, optional, um, by mistake, there was a miss where the omit empty tag was missing. And that's why this uh, tool detected it as a, a breaking change. So if the omit empty struct uh, tag was present, this particular field would not have been populated and because it would have been omitted and this tool um, would not uh, detect that drift. So in order to prove it out, I uh, published a commit. Um, this commit simply changes that tag to omit empty. And I could see that with that tag, the tool did not uh, um, generate this diff. So on, with that fix, only one API field was detected and that was, um, you know, okay. So, so the, the my second one is the second yeah. one is not. Uh, I mean, it's fine that it was like that, right? It's not uh, like no. maybe it was. I mean, someone can say that it is a must now, right? Mm, no, I don't think someone can say it's a must because. So what happens currently is that the runtime user is defaulted to zero. Now because zero user has a very distinct um, meaning in context of uh, Linux. So this means a root user, right? Um, what happens currently is that even though you are using a different user internally, if this field was not uh, you know, populated explicitly by the controller, um, it will come up with a, a zero value, which could be different from the value you were expecting. So what okay. I'm trying to say is, sorry. No, no, it's it's okay. I, I just think that, I think this is, uh, usually with APIs, it's a declarative thing that it, the fact that no one populated, it's a bug. The fact that it is supposed to be always populated, that's the point, I, I mean, uh, no, so omit uh, anyway, it's it's a question about if, if someone wants to say in a declarative way that this field must be displayed, uh, and even if it's uh, zero, it must be displayed, then then I think this is not wrong. I mean, it, it's depending on what they wanted originally. Uh, uh, so I think there are two um, points here, right? This field is in the status section. So it's not declared by the user. It's populated by the controller. And uh, the way I understand it is controller, because of the omit empty missing tag, controller is populating an uh, incorrect value in this field. Oh, it can be, it can, I can share some of the fields are not always populated by, I mean, the status. Uh, mm -hmm. Usually not only the, there is the real controller that usually starts to handle uh, handle things, but it will not populate many. For example, most of the status will be populated by the virt handler. So maybe it's zero because uh, the virt handler has not yet started handling it. Once the virt handler, uh, it reached the virt handler, then the virt handler will update the status and will fill up the fields. So That's this right. is why- yes. uh, it, yeah. No, but in that case, so let's say you generate a, a VMI, right? You create a VMI, then the status field is populated by word controller. Um, the way I understand it is the fields that are managed by word controller, it will populate that and everything else will be uh, missing. So it, they have omit empty tags and they will not have incorrect values. Then word handler will come into picture and it will fill out all the other fields which were not filled out by the word controller or update those fields. So yeah, I understand that the status object is transitioning from um, one, uh, one state to another. But in this particular case, because of the omit empty missing tag, it, it was giving an incorrect value. So it is not actually transitioning from one state to another. It will always give an incorrect value. Okay. 
and that's why it is um, wrong and that is attributed to the fact that the golang defaulting it works um, in such a way that bulls are um, defaulted to false integer is defaulted to zero and so on and so forth so because of that we are seeing this bug and what i want to identify is whether or not this is a genuine bug is up for discussion like we just did right but having an automated tool to find this out will provide uh, value to reviewers where they can rely on a tool and not um, you know run into some kind of uh, human errors while while reviewing the prs um, I, I think that's the main uh, um, highlight of why this kind of unit test will, will be helpful. Sure. So yeah. I agree 100% objectivity. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I, I think this is a very rudimentary uh, POC. Um, the ideal way how I see this would be um, this kind of unit tests can be plugged into um, CI/CD pipeline. That's what um, Kubernetes has right now. The only overhead would be every time you cut a release, uh, you'll have to save this uh, directory with the test data. Um, and that's a release time overhead, um, which could be documented or automated um, easily. Okay, so I think um, that's all I had. Thanks a lot for um, allowing me to talk through that proposal. I think what I wanted to take away from this discussion is what would be the best way to move this particular PR forward? Um, and what would be the next steps? Uh, I, I think there are um, suggestions by um, Edward on um, how you know I can move this forward. So I'll distill those out um, in this uh, document. Hey, nicely done. Uh, I, I think this is progress. And, and yeah, it's, it, like every piece of software, it's less than perfect, but that's how it gets better. You put something out there and you improve it along the line. So well done. Thanks. Um, thanks. Uh, I, I think we have some, you know, progress and a lot of things to do. So we'll get started. Um, Edward, do you... Um, I know you've asked me to reach out um, to the maintainers about um, this, and uh, you've also, you know, talked about the proposal for the life cycle. Um, would you be able to, you know, when that is public, would you be able to, you know, um, put put that um, proposal here in this document so that um, we can talk about that? Um, in, in the following call. Sure. So, uh, first of all, I think it. Will, uh, I'm pretty sure that if it will, it will be public uh, on 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 the, the dev uh, on the Kubernetes dev uh, mailing list and probably on the on the meeting. Mm -hmm. And and um, yes, I will try to try to ping you or edit here. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I'll also keep an eye out on the mailing list. Yes. And um, uh, so, and the regarding reaching out to maintainers, I think my um, the idea I have is to um, look at the owners file and probably start a thread in uh, in Kubert Dev uh, channel to see if I can, you know, get some thoughts from uh, maintainers about this. Um, so I, I think those are the two next steps I would take. Is that um, in line with the suggestions? 
Yes, I think that's a good start. Yes, if you if you say that uh, it doesn't work, like uh, I don't know if it's because of the specific period, but if you say that there is a problem, then we can try to or you can you can raise it also in the channel in the Slack. You you need it's like a, it's like pushing an idea so people will be yeah. aware and try to handle it is is not always easy but uh i think we there is a need to try all kind of ways in the end you could just uh, reach uh, if nothing works then reaching the um there is a community uh, uh andrew i think is a can help or uh, just contacting mm -hmm. specific maintainers if you know anyone that maybe you, you were in contact before, your colleagues were in contact before, things like that. It's like, this is at least how I'm working in the project. Like if I yeah. am trying to, to go something like that. Yeah, makes sense. I, I think that's an awesome um, guidance. Um, so yeah, I will take those um, next steps. Um, I think there was one more uh, open item in the agenda. We wanted to see if we can, you know, introduce a PR to bootstrap um, SIG API um, on top of this particular um, SIG governance API. But um, so I think there, so my thoughts are that before we go ahead and formally bootstrap this API, uh, sorry, SIG API group, I would really like to get thoughts on, on this proposal. So this proposal will become like a, a prerequisite for all the discussions, whether we want to um, have this particular um, SIG or not, and, and you know, iron out all the discussion points. And then once, once we have a conclusion on that proposal, we can, um, you know, create this, particular um, PR, but I don't know if other folks have thoughts on this. Uh, yeah, I okay. don't know. I don't have any, any opinion here. You can, sorry. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so I think I'll reach out to Lee, um, you know, and get it get his thoughts uh, on on this. Uh, so by the way, I sent you, uh, I put on the chat the, you want an example of features that are alpha and they are just feeds in a pod. So mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, one, I think there are more. Uh, I don't know if we, if, if we have a scenario when someone removed something, but uh, I can tell you that in the end, covert is not Kubernetes, so I'm I'm pretty sure that we don't want to have. I mean, if it will help us, uh, then we'll we'll lower the bar a little bit. Uh, Kubernetes needs to be it's like a, a more platform, a platform for platforms maybe or something like that. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure if all the rules will apply. I I didn't check if they have. Uh, um, if they have an example of that they remove something, but uh, but if they didn't remove it, the field from the struct, it's still not working. It's like it may maybe they left it there, like uh, an alpha field was left, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but they, it's not used. So it's like uh, so maybe that is maybe that's an input that needs to be discussed in. Uh, should we yeah. must leave feeds like that? Maybe yes, I'm not sure. Do we want to be strict with that? Yes, no, I don't know. But uh, alphas, feeds with alpha exist. Like, uh, yeah. That's it. yeah. Yeah, that's a great uh, example. Thank you. I will look into, um, I will look into the discussion that uh, preceded the introduction of this field and try to see if we can come up with some kind of guidance from there. Um, I think I'm like, when this feature m was proposed, V126, there must be some kind of uh, enhancement or 
um, design discussion that we can take a look and you know draw inspiration um, of what Kubernetes is doing and what we could do. I I certainly agree that you know we don't have to take all of what Kubernetes does and we can be little more selective uh, to suit our needs, but yeah, uh, we can take that as a guiding point. So, yeah, I will yeah. Uh, let me note this down here. And yeah, I'll take an action item to go through this. Hi, LA. Um, Edward, I got to drop. I've got a call, but thank you. This is a productive meeting. It's off to a good start, a good conversation. I appreciate you including me. Yeah, sure. See you next Thanks week. for your thoughts. Thank you. Bye -bye. All right. Thank you both. Thank you. Bye bye. Um, okay. I, I think that's all I have. Um, uh, okay. So thank you. Thank you again. Thank you for investing in this. And I hope you'll manage to push this forward. If you're, okay. uh, if you if you need something like uh, help with uh, contacting people, if everything fails, then let me know. But I think the, I think sure. the, you will get attention for sure. Okay, awesome. I'll Thanks. let you know. Thanks a lot, Edward. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you. Bye-bye.